I can see it. A, a lot of familiar face, uh, faces and names. So I'm Jyoti Sudha, I'm a GP in uh, Redbridge. I'm also one of the diabetes leads for um, CCG, but today really here as a training hub clinical lead um, supporting the UCLP pathway. Um, Paul, can we just share the slides? And Paul's um, um, lovely manager, a lead for BHR, CEPN training hub. Um, that um, that supporting the UCLP pathway in terms of education. So we've got the low risk diabetes pathway today. Um, it might be, as I said, for some of the pharmacists on the call today, this might be really basic. Uh, however, it's nice to know what the others will be doing because you can then within the pathway understand what your role is. So mm -hmm. today, I'm not telling you what the pathway is because uh, the pathway itself has got to be designed as such. Uh, by your PCN, but what you would understand is what goes in a pathway and what are some of the parameters and the principles that are used in the pathway. Um, so, I, so I hope you get something out of it, even for people that have done um, sort of diabetes before, but really for the pharmacists here today, I think would be interesting for you would be the medium and um, the high risk, we'll be talking more about management there. Okay, so next slide please, uh, Paul. So um, for those people um, that um, have been on the hypertension one, you know, we always and always and always start with the learning outcomes. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you can understand the UCLP pathway today and why UCLP decided to come up with a pathway. Also understand your, your role in managing the low risk pathway. So those of you that have or are aware that they will be managing the low risk pathway, you really understand what you need to do in that pathway. Understand diagnosis and management, and I'm going to go through really basic diagnosis and management of diabetes. It's nothing major, although you would not be required to make that, but you may be in a position to signpost the patient. Hence, it's important you understand the diagnosis and management. We also really understand when to refer. And when I say refer, not just the hospital, but also refer on to the medium and high risk pathway within your, you know, who is it that you need to then now signpost the patient to. The main thing really what you know, need to know from here today is the annual review, because that's what you will be doing as a low risk pathway. So what is a good annual review look at? Uh, there are things that you have to do as part of QOF, but a lot of things are missing in QOF. So what are the other things that you would need to consider in a patient with diabetes? Is there anything anyone else wants to know today um, Please put in the chat function and I will try and address that if there's any other learning outcomes people want out of this. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to stop here, but I'll just allow you to just put that in the chat function. The next slide, please, Paul. So um, for people that attended the hypertension one, um, just to recap, at UCLP um, were, um, came up with a pathway really based on the uh, post-COVID recovery um, and an understanding that primary care will be inundated with requests left right and center. So there needs to be some prioritization. There needs to be a consideration to see patients um, based on their risk. This also was based on the uh, fact that we are actually changing in a way how primary care can also looking at a lot of digital tools um, and, and remote sort of um, uh, assessments. So it's incorporated all the three elements and principles and, and stratified patients into the risk. And you see here on the slide, the, um, the risk um, uh, that they've done. So you will be in the green sort of uh, low risk, uh, the other patients are managing the low risk, the other, other clinicians will be managing the medium high risk. And you can see that that's based on your HbA1c, which is a diabetes control, along with your ethnicity, frailty, previous heart disease, previous ulcers, any other complications. So really, if you've got any complications uh, associated with diabetes, um, be it social complication or medical complication, ethnicity, then you are not in the low risk group, uh, you're in the medium and high risk group. I can just hear some um, sort of um, um, rustling in the background. If you could mute yourself, it'd be really helpful because my internet today uh, is also playing up. Thank you for that. So just the next slide, please. I hope that's clear in terms of the pathway um, and, and, so, um, and where you will be doing the low risk one. 
So I'd like you now to just use the poll function, which Paul is going to just put up, to rate your confidence in managing diabetes. You, you can obviously, I don't expect you to um, um, sort of um, um, use medium and high risk as the baseline, it's the low risk. So just tell me how confident are you if I were to give you a clinic tomorrow and say to you, can you do annual reviews on these patients? These are diabetic low risk patients. Can you please run an annual review? So how, what's your confidence rating? 10 being the highest and one being the lowest. So I'll just give you um, a minute or so to just um, do the poll. Just to say, it's not letting me submit my answer. It's letting me click it, but not submit. That's the same Paul? thing as well. I can't submit either. Paul? Yeah, it is a bit weird because we've only got um, three people who have responded so far. I'm not sure why. So some people can and some people can't. Um, if people can keep trying just for a second. No, we're not getting more. So let me let me stop it and I'll relaunch it. So can I just, yeah, okay. If you relaunch it, well, and it's not, what we'll do is if you just keep those scores um, uh, and put them in the chat function, we'll just give, give us one second, Paul. We're going to try it again. Um, and Paul, I can't submit it either. I've tried it again. I can't submit it. I can't either. Actually, if you go <laughs> down, there's two questions, Paul, for some reason. Yeah. I can submit the second one, not the first one. Do people want to try that? If you just scroll it down. Can people do it now? Yeah. Yeah, so I think, Paul, there was two, two sets of questions. So the second one we can submit. If everyone's done it, Paul, just check the um, numbers. And if you could just, there's 12 people on the, on the call here. We've got six responses so far. Or let me have a look, actually. Uh, yeah, we've got six responses so far. These can people just, oh, it would just really be helpful. You can try and do. Okay, well, I'll stop. Confidence rating. I'll, I'll stop it there. Uh, maybe people are still having a problem. Uh, and we'll just have a look and see what we've got. Yeah, so we've got ones and fives. Okay. And I can see we've got, oh, actually, we've got two responses. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so maybe with the two together, we've got all of them. So there's a few tens, well, very few tens, mostly around seven. Okay, that's brilliant. I hope when we see more seven onwards, um, finish the poll. Thank you. Next slide, please, Paul. So again, I'd like you to just do a self assessment on these 10 questions uh, and we'll redo them. And you don't have to share the scores with anyone but yourself. So just keep those scores to yourself and just put true and false. So only patients over 40 should be screened for diabetes. That's the first question. So just put true and false. Um, patients should have a review every six months for the aid care processes. And I'm so sorry, the C is missing there. Uh, it's care processes. The aid care processes, every six months the patient should HbA1c only. So when you diagnose a patient, it's saying that you should use HbA1c, so true or false. Diagnostic level is HbA1c of 48. So when you make a diagnosis of diabetes, you, the cutoff is 48. Then this is a, the next question is about blood sugars. All patients should aim for sugars between four and seven. So when you have a patient with diabetes, if they ask you what should be my levels, you tell them actually it should be 47 for everyone, true or false. Number six is hypoglycemia levels, that's low blood sugar, is a level less than four. So when we say somebody's hypoglycemic, what's the number that we're looking at? Is it four, true or false? Foot check includes pulses and sensations only. So when you have your a patient that gets the diabetic foot check on an annual basis, you check the pulses and sensations only. True or false. Number eight is all diabetic patients with high cholesterol should be started on a statin. So basically what we're saying is a, a patient with diabetes with high cholesterol should be given a cholesterol tablet. True or false. Blood pressure targets for patients with diabetes is less than 140.90. So 
for people that attended hypertension, we discussed the targets there. So this is more about a patient with diabetes and their blood pressure targets. Should it be less than 140, 90? True or false? And the last one is insulin lumps should be checked at every review. So where they inject, you should check for the lump at every review, so true and false. So I hope you've been able to answer. I'll just give you 15 seconds in case some people want to just go and reflect on the questions again. And then Paul, we can then move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so uh, I was talking to you about the uh, pathway and I've explained to you why uh, UCLB used the approach and actually what the low, you know, one of the, what are some of the parameters they use to decide who's low, medium and high risk. Now, this is what the expectation from people or the clinician or you know, the workforce that's going to be looking after each of the um, uh, risk stratified groups. We are here because of the green um, group today. So this, we, we say HCA, but it could be anybody really. So we're expecting, but again, this is a PCM decision, is that somebody, whether it's HCA or senior admin team, and that's on top, the gray box, does the pre- review check so they you know ensure that the diabetes blood tests are done they ensure all the urine tests are done they ensure smoking diet exercise the circumstances the weight if the patient is able to do it that is done and most of these things you can do remotely including the blood pressure if they've got a blood pressure machine at home they then review and decide actually the patient now is in the low risk however the low risk um sort of um searches have been shared and if they haven't already with the PCN, will be shared. So you would already have patients in the low risk category that the HCO, the senior um, admin team, does the basic background work on. And then they either come and see, speak, video, depending on the patient. So this is where the new model is, you know, general practice model is incorporated. They, you decide what is best, whether they need to come in, you know, video or which, whatever is easier for you and the patient. Um, we then ask and um, see if you can look at their uh, compliance adherence. Um, just understand that they know what an annual health check is and what are the parameters and what are the checks they need to do. What is the understanding? Do you need to revisit the diabetes understanding and its complications? The next bit is supply and delivery. And I'm asking everyone, particularly the pharmacists, um, to be uh, completely clued on to this uh, because there are patients that you would note haven't had their medication issued for some time. And actually, um, the more uh, that we are particularly in our practice doing this, more patients I'm finding that are not really taking, you know, the, the usage of medication is not as it should be. So they're clearly there's an adherence problem there. So just look at how many you know, prescriptions have been taken by the patient and is it that they're taking on a regular basis and understand if there's a problem, particularly if the vulnerable patient is on the delivery sector. Then you again signpost to the education. You go through the risk factors again, like the diet, the weight, smoking. Now, via any guidance, I can go through as much detail or as little, but what I do is there are some lovely leaflets on DVNA guidance, which I've shared uh, uh, later on, I just hand it to the patient and say, this is your responsibility. If I'm not seeing them, I actually just at QRX them to say, this is what guidance, uh, DVLA guidance is, follow it. I remind them out of the flu jab, if they do the pneumonia jab, I remind them. Obviously now you're gonna to have to include COVID jab as well. Um, and the last bit is of course diabetic foot check. So you advise them, you tell them what to look out for and we'll have a brief discussion a bit later. The other things are the red flags. So a patient who has got diabetes is at the risk of getting diabetes eye disease. And if they complain of floaters, flashing light, it could be a complication developing, it's a red flag. They need to be reviewed by the hospital, you know, immediately really. Blood sugar control, when I say red flag, if they're saying we are getting, you know, 30s and I'm feeling unwell, you'd now start thinking they're developing complications. So, See what your pathway is within the PCN um, and speak to whoever, whichever clinician is responsible for the high risk, because these patients might be going into diabetes ketoacidosis uh, and they need a review, whether in the surgery or at the hospital. 
Just tell them if they get infections, it's likely the blood pressure they're actually going high. Sometimes it actually goes low as well because they're not eating. And it all depends. But just warn them if they get an infection, they should seek help. They should bring you back. And of course, sign forth to, um, say if they're depressed, you can sign forth from IAP, et cetera. So whatever the local resources are, we then put a call and uh, recall code. And then they go back, depending on their sort of risk, if their HDMI is high, they go in the medium or the high risk. So I hope that's clear, but it will become even more clear when we go through it um, a bit more as the slides move on. I'm going to just jump and check here and see if anybody's got any questions so far. If you don't want to speak and say, then please put it in the chat function. I'm just going to give you 15 seconds to um, just put anything or ask anything um, that we've covered so far. And just as a reminder, we've covered what the UCLP pathway is and how you stratify, um, and the expectation within the pathway um, um, in the low risk group, which is what you're here, but also having a, a, an understanding of what's in the medium and high risk um, and, and how you signpost people. But just bear in mind, there will be a pathways within your PC and, or practices that have to be agreed if you are seeing a patient who you're worried about, who is it within the PCN or the uh, practice is, is uh, going to be um, supporting you. So that's what the local, local sort of um, pathway is. Okay, so no questions so far. So Paul, let's just move on to the next slide, please. Now, I just wanted to put this out there. Although you are not um, diagnosing a patient, I just wanted you to be aware of this because we are still very low in our prevalence of diabetes across BHR. So we do need to increase the numbers. And this is purely if you see a patient uh, that you think uh, could be diabetic, what is the approach? So just to remind you, this is not the low risk pathway, but I wanted to give you a background. So we start screening people a bit more for diabetes. Now, this is all nice. Um, so NICE is saying that you adopt a risk assessment approach to um, checking patients with diabetes. Now, there is a, um, a link that I've um, put on. Unfortunately, we couldn't really open that link here. But this is a link. If you follow on the Diabetes UK, you can just ask your article to the patient. They can do their own assessment. You don't have to do it for them. And they will then get a score as low, medium, and high risk. Now, what NICE is saying is if they are high risk, they should be checked for diabetes. They should have blood tests. Yeah. And what they're saying is who should you offer this to? Should be all patients, adults over 40. But if you are of South Asian Chinese, so you have at the certain ethnic groups, then from the age of 25. Or we've just lost the slides. Okay. Oh, thank you, Good Paul. Thank you so much. So this is what the, um, the risk assessment uh, looks like. Paul, if you just go on to find your, out your risk, if you just click the bottom bit, yeah? It takes you to, and if you just put in male, and if you just put in, I don't know, 45, next. And if you put a South Asian, and uh, family history, just put yes. Yeah? And you've just, just put base circumference of 100. Yeah. Yeah, and if you just put, I don't know, 5, um, 10. I'm clearly describing somebody, isn't it? Um, and if you put kilos, um, I don't know, um, if you just put kilos, um, um, I don't know, 80. Yeah, and then you put next. Yep, so just say no to blood pressure. Yeah, and then um, just say no thanks, I'd rather skip directly. So just to put the no thanks, yep. So now it's giving you a score. It tells you your score is um, 24. It explains all about your um, score uh, and it tells you right at the top that you're in a moderate risk, okay? And then basically what you as a practice do is, um, uh, what the NICE is saying is only high risk get diabetes, but in practice and practicality, I, I probably would get them checked anyway. 
Um, but what you notice is this patient has got a, um, a large waist circumference. Have they got um, um, sort of, I don't know, if they've got are they, um, uh, high blood pressure, is their blood pressure under control? So you're looking at other things. Yeah, so it's about risk assessment and making sure um, that patients are signposted and you do a brief intervention. You just say to them, you are at moderate risk. You can delay this risk by exercising diet, weight, lifestyle bits, essentially. Thank you, Paul. Just go back to the slide, please. Thank you. So this bit, the patient can do it themselves. And you can ask your RS. And again, I reiterate, this is not the responsibility of the low risk, but because I'm using this opportunity to just tell you, uh, if you've got patients who are eligible, then please risk assess or get them to self-assess. And actually, what do you do? Once you've got a high-risk high, high risk patient who you screen, what would happen is they either come back saying that they are pre-diabetic, in which case you refer them for pre-diabetes NDPP, the National Diabetes Prevention Program, and every year they have a diabetes blood test. You can, you know, you get the results back and they're diabetic, in which case they go into, you know, the relevant pathway. Or they come back at moderate risk, that means you signpost them to exercise programs, the lifestyle, et cetera. Nice is saying reassess them at three years. If you're at low risk, reassess them at five years. So just to recap, eligible patients are patients who are over uh, age of 40, but from 25 if you're of certain ethnic origin, and also adults with some conditions, which you're going to just look at in the next slide, which increases the risk of type 2 diabetes. In my experience, potentially everyone has got some risk factor or the other, and basically everybody gets things. Uh, but however, as per NICE, this is the approach you need to adopt, okay? Any questions so far or any confusion so far in terms of who you're screening? Again, put it in the chat function. I'm more than happy to um, multitask and look at the chat function. So next um, slide, please, Paul. So just a bit about who to test, as I said, in addition to the screening, if the patient comes to you and tells you that they've got symptoms, you, you know, they've got, they're drinking too much, they're eating too much, maybe even weight loss, they're getting recurrent infections, you're thinking, have they got diabetes? Even tiredness, have they got diabetes? And remember, a large majority of the patients don't get any symptoms at all until actually they're way down the line. So um, this is where the screening and risk factors and risk assessment comes in handy. So they're symptomatic, absolutely, they get a test. Annual health check, over the age of 40, patients get that. And based on the risk assessment, we see dozens of the high risk, they get screened. But of course, if they've got risk factors. So I put some pictures here. Uh, so there would be some answers here, but could you just put down what you feel are the risk factors in the chat function or say it, whatever's easier. So tell me what increases your risk of diabetes. You've got some of the answers on the pictures, actually. And just refer to that photo that's there. What is it that you're seeing there? Yeah, getting answers. So please, please use the chat function. So I've got weight, I've got ethnicity, lifestyle, not taking medication. Okay. Gabble, would you like to say a bit more about not taking medication? Um, I was just mentioning back to the point of adhering to the plan or what they might already be on. It could contribute towards their diabetes, right? So yeah, that's absolutely. one of the main things. Yeah, okay, so that's brilliant. So if they are poorly controlled, uh, you know, uh, they, yeah, absolutely. Uh, gestational diabetes is really good, Nikki. That's a really good point. Yeah. Okay, right. So we've got, yeah, diet. Lovely, Sharon. Excellent. Lifestyle, absolutely. That's great. Anyone can guess what's in that photo on the neck of that patient? Any guesses? Okay. Is that inactivity? Or, uh, so if you see this photo on the right, you've got the dark sort of mark on the neck. See that sort of pigmentation on the neck. 
And that's called acanthosis nigris. And you see actually a lot of patients, sometimes it's on the sort of cheek, um, sometimes on the forehead, neck is darker. It's like a velvety sort of darkness. Uh, sometimes under the arm to the axillary area, area. And that generally indicates insulin resistance. These patients are, this is acanthosis nigricans. And actually there is a high risk that, you know, highly likely this patient will either be pre-diabetic or diabetic. And you, you typically see somebody with a thick sort of um, neck, um, uh, you know, a, a, a large neck circumference, a bit of a, a abdominal a central obesity, um, and they've got that metabolic syndrome type look, so they're overweight and they get these doctors. Skin tags, if you see those little skin tags, you know those tags that are coming out, that's an indication that they've got insulin that's been produced, but that insulin is not going to be working properly, in which case they will develop diabetes. So I won't say any more here, but just remember that if you see a patient with that darkness, you're thinking actually that is a risk factor as well. Next slide, please, Paul. So here's the other risk factors. So family history, there's nothing you can do about family history, you know, they, that, that, that they've got from their parents. Obesity, something they can do, gestational be mentioned. Patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Again, this is a patient who can get um, insulin resistance. So just bear that in mind. These patients, if you've got a known diagnosis of PCOS, it's likely that they are at risk of diabetes. Ethnicity we mentioned, low birth weight actually is linked with developing diabetes later on. There's lots of studies being um, done and already done on this. Um, drugs like steroids can cause diabetes. I mentioned about metabolic syndrome, acanthosis is what I mentioned on the neck. Patients with fatty liver, and those clinicians that are on today, do you remember when you get a scan and scan showing fatty liver, that is an indication that you need to screen that patient. They are at risk as well. Inactivity, we've mentioned lifestyle and diet, of course. Okay, so I think most of the people got everything here, but do remember there are some clinical conditions that will risk um, um, you becoming or, or, or you know, um, um, causing diabetes as well, which you need to be aware of and screen these people. Okay. Okay, chunking and checking. Any questions so far? Anything anyone wants to say, add? Any of the clinicians, if they've got any other views? Um, I'm just going to wait for 10 seconds to put on. And I'll say to people, please, this is your opportunity to ask. Don't feel shy. Um, just ask. It doesn't matter. It's a very safe environment. And we all, on, you know, we're really trying our best to try and support patients. If you don't ask now, then it's likely that you're going to just, you know, think about that question and never get that answer. So please ask. Okay. So let's move on to the next slide, please. So I just, I just talked to you about pre uh, checking patients and who to check. I've told you about the risk factors. I've told you everyone from the age of 40, but certain ethnic groups from the age of 25 need to be checked for diabetes. So a 25-year-old Asian, Afro-Caribbean, you know, certain ethnic group, as we discussed before, you need to offer them diabetes checks, okay? And I is saying you risk assess patients. Um, and the higher risk you do, and I've, I've mentioned to you that you repeat the diabetes step in practicality, and of the GPs that are there, I think uh, patients come for several other reasons that they end up having diabetes checked anyway. But my fear is that we're not increasing the prevalence because the people that should be having the check are not coming forward, or they don't even come to the GP practice. So just thinking about how do we address the prevalence issues. Okay. Now, I just wanted to put this out there just so you guys are aware. You don't need to know greater details, but the largest um, group of diabetes, or actually the, the, the common one is type two diabetes. Um, and other ones are gestational. You've got type one diabetes, which absolutely you need insulin. And usually you have patients, the younger age group getting type one, but I have actually come across even later on. Now I've come across a recent 56 year old who actually suddenly is type one. So don't just be fooled by the age there. You've got things like LADA, Modi, steroid induced diabetes. I'm not going to go into the details of this and the type for this session is probably going to be covered in the medium and high risk. But just so you're aware, when the patient said they've got a diabetes, and if you've seen the notes, they've got LADA, you think, ah, oh, that's not diabetes. Actually, it is diabetes. You manage the annual review in the same way because they've got the same imbalance for the sugar, essentially. Okay? So just wanted to put that slide out there. Um, next slide, please, Paul. And this is just really for awareness. 
Right, a quick um, thing about uh, diagnosis. So now, um, quite, um, what, was it three years, three, four years? They, they introduced the HbA1c to be used as a diagnostic sort of um, 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 tool. Previously, we used to rely on fasting sugars. We did lots of GTTs, um, glucose tolerance tests, and we did a random sugar test. But now, actually, and quite helpfully, um, in certain patients, HbA1c, actually most of them, you can use HbA1c. There are um, a small group that you can't use HbA1c, and I'm not going to go through the details for this, um, this group because you're not going to be making C diagnosis. However, just to let you know, the diagnostic criteria, just remember these three readings, HbA1c 48, fasting sugar 7, random sugar 11.1. .1. So it's above that is diabetes. Now, if you've got a patient who's symptomatic, that means they're tired, they've got eating too much, drinking too much, and they get any of these reading, even one, you can make a diagnosis. However, if they've got no symptoms and you've done it as part of screening, then you need to repeat the test and do the same test. Don't do a HP1C and then a, a fasting sugar. If you're doing a fasting sugar, repeat the fasting sugar again. And that's to make a diagnosis. And you've got to do it two weeks apart using the same test. Practically, in my experience, um, if you ask a patient, are they tired? I haven't yet to come across a patient who doesn't say that they are tired. And actually, tiredness is a symptom of diabetes. So, you know, just be guided by that as you can try. And if you're not sure, um, I, I'm not expecting the low risk group to be making a diagnosis, but I just wanted you to be aware of the diagnostic criteria. So, three readings I want you to remember for diagnosis 48. And that's the level also we are aiming for in terms of the target for patients once they are diagnosed. Fasting sugar is um, uh, uh, more than seven and random sugar is 11.1. .1. When I say fasting sugar, it's the first thing in the morning sugar that they have a blood test for. Okay. Any questions so far, guys? Any confusion about the diagnostic criteria? So we know who to test. And again, who, who are we going to test? Is patients who are symptomatic, patients that are you know, being screened for as high risk, and then if there are risk factors, if you're Asian or you know, African Caribbean, from the age of 25, you're being screened for diabetes. So just, just remember that. And when you're screened, if you get a patient who's symptomatic, tired, you know, polyuria, polydipsia, weight loss, et cetera, HbA1c 48, sugar over seven, random over 11.1, .1, they've got diabetes. No uh, symptoms, you repeat the test after two weeks, using the same parameters. If you've done an HbA1c, repeat HbA1c, okay? Um, and again, I think uh, I'm not, I'm not, actually I won't go. So uh, I won't go into the details of where you need to be careful. It's probably for the medium risk, but sometimes you cannot use HbA1c for as a diagnostic criteria, um, but that's not for you guys. It's, you know, just pass it on to the, your lovely clinical team. Okay, so next slide please, Paul. And I hope it's clear so far. Now, this is what happens at diagnosis, okay? So you've got a patient, who you've, you've made a diagnosis. These patients should um, ideally um, be called in because it's the first ever time, but equally, you can use the model that has been agreed as a PCN. You know, if you wanna do a video call, the patient's happy, do it, that's fine. It is, in a way, breaking bad news to some. Some patients are, are quite shocked because the first thing I've, in my experience, most of them say, but I've got no symptoms. You know, so I can't have diabetes. I haven't got any symptoms. So often you don't discuss anything, but, you know, you break the bad news. And, you know, but equally, there will be some patients saying, actually, I was expecting it. What do I do next? Or there will just be some patients who say, well, yeah, fine. My father had it and he lived with 90. Fine, no big deal. So you, you need to just see who you have in front of you to decide whether you're going to do the whole lot today or you're going to do it in chunks. So you're going to break the bad news. You're going to then discuss um, you know, what they need to do and how they need to follow up, et cetera, in some, you know, two or three appointments. Again, this is where the personalization comes in. Look at the patient, yeah? Don't look at what you're meant to do because cough tells you or because knife tells you. You look at the patient and see what is it, how much are they taking, taking in, okay? So you explain the diagnosis. And actually, I often use um, the diabetes. If you go onto Diabetes UK website, lovely videos. There also is on patient.co.uk, my favorite site, 
really simple leaflets and also in Diabetes UK, if you want to you know, leaflets in other languages, that you can share with the patients who act your RX, explaining the diagnosis in a bit more detail. It also goes to about, you know, what is included in the annual health check, et cetera. So do utilize some of those. And I've just put the, um, the uh, address here for Diabetes um, UK. What Diabetes UK also is with is to provide identity cards. You can download identity cards to say you've got type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, or you're diabetic on tablets or, or whatever. So there are, you know, um, they can carry those cards if they want. Obviously at diagnosis, now at diagnosis, what you're trying to do is not to confirm the diagnosis, you're also trying to do uh, is assess them for complications. So, you know, you, you want to make sure that they understand, they change their lifestyle and you assess for complications. So you want to just check um, if they've already got the complications. So of course you would do things like BMI, smoking, alcohol, you'll make the referral as appropriate. And for just for you to know, you can refer for exercise programs, and you can also refer for digital weight management, which you're now probably seeing on your screen. So they can be referred for digital weight management uh, programs. So this is all done sort of digitally and remotely uh, for patients, appropriate patients. At diagnosis, you must refer them for trusted education, yeah? And just bear in mind, and I'm telling you this because in the low risk pathway, you might come across an alert on the system where the patient's been missed. And it says here, referral for structured education due or something. So make sure that there was a simple form that they are actually referred for that, okay? And then you refer them for eye screening, uh, which is actually a simple form where you just have to tick, yeah? And the tick that includes that you get referred uh, and then they are followed up from there. Guys, just give me one second. Sorry, guys. So, um, so the eye screening is basically you are um, you just it's a tick form, tick box form. Get referred at diagnosis, but check at annual review. Have have you had your eye check? And that you don't have to bother about because it's an automatic recall, and the eye eye people do it themselves. Um, so that's, that's a good thing that's taken kind of out and they've got a recall and call system. But I just check, have you had your eye screening? You've got to do the foot check. This is to look for complication and we'll talk a bit more about it a bit later. And the foot check essentially is to see if they've got diabetes related complications, give them education as well at the same time, no matter how to look after the feet. You will do the blood test. Of course, if you, they haven't had an HbA1c as a diagnostic uh, sort of criteria, then you do your HbA1c because that will help you decide what sort of treatment they need, whether they can just have lifestyle or they need oral medication, et cetera. You will then do other things like kidney functions, liver function, blood count, thyroid function. Thyroid, because diabetes is an autoimmune condition, it can affect or associated with thyroid disorders as well. So it's to check for that. Kidneys, because diabetes can affect kidneys. Uh, liver, because it gives our liver. And, um, and full blood count you do, because not directly say it can affect the blood count, diabetes, but in certain patients with a low hemoglobin, you cannot use HbA1c as a, um, a diagnostic or an assessment criteria. You need to use other things like phosphosamine, et cetera. So just that's why you're doing these tests. Urine test, because ACR, which is protein in the urine, and actually, the first marker of kidney disease in a patient with diabetes is ACR, and you've got to do the first urine test in the morning, the fasting urine test, basically. And, um, and, it's, and the good thing is, actually, the reason why you're going to look for ACR is because you can put them on certain drugs like ACEs, Ramipril, Losartan, as for people that attended the hypertension we discussed, and reverse this, actually. So you can reverse the early kidney damage should you see, which is why it's important that you do this test on a yearly basis. And actually, this is one of the tests. And simply, I think because the way it's done that you've got to go to urine, and it's horrible the way you know the, the bottles are. Um, so it's not a user-friendly bottle, but actually as BHR, we are not doing very well on ACR. And actually, I've just told you the importance of doing it because you can reverse the early kidney damage. Now, this is the other thing that's not in quad but NICE tells you discuss contraception in the relevant women because if you've got poor diabetes control, it is associated strongly with fetal malformation, um, you know, big babies um, and um, deformities and, you know, um, sort of miscarriages, et cetera, and problems conceiving. So make sure you address 
contraception. And should they be planning pregnancy, you need to put them on five milligram folic acid, not 400. So please remember this. The, you know, just, uh, just ask that question. Are they planning pregnancy? If they are, make sure you, you let the clinician know that they're put on five milligram of folic acid, okay? You do a blood pressure, you do a pulse. I'm telling you pulse because atrial fibrillation, again, association with diabetes, you need, and we need to increase our prevalence. So check the pulse for irregularity. The other bits you would do is screening for depression. And actually, um, the recent study that I looked at, 70% of the patients with type 2 diabetes have got underlying depression. And of course, if they're depressed, they will not be able to look after their diabetes. They will be less motivated to make the changes. So really, we need to address this. I ask as a self-referral um, service, have the number on your screen, you know, just give it to the patient if you feel that they've got uh, or um, signpost to the relevant clinician based on your local pathway. You need to tell them they'll be entitled to free prescriptions if they go on medication. You need to share the DDLA guidance with them. You need to tell them if they are traveling, insurance, work. Again, it all depends on the, you know, on the severity of diabetes and the medication. But these are just some pointers that you need to cover at diagnosis. We talked to the, uh, them about immunization. We've already covered the, you know, the flu, pneumonia, COVID now. And also you curist them. You curist them because you need to decide whether they need a statin based again on that hypertension sort of um, talk that we did. Q risk over 10%, they will need a statin. Okay. And I've told you, please sign post on the Diabetes um, UK website, lots and lots of information. Uh, lots of videos, and they can sign up identity cards, but more importantly, arrange a follow-up, okay? Based on your uh, abnormal, abnormal findings, if you feel that they're overweight and you've signed posted, arrange a follow-up with them. If you feel that the diabetes is, uh, control isn't right and, you know, they need a you know, follow-up, put them in the right pathway, but just, just say that we will arrange a follow-up. But again, you've got to get those pathways within the PCNs right, okay? I've put here skills that Sometimes these patients, I said, you might get a patient who's quite blase. No, it's fine. You know, my parents had diabetes and they, you know, they you know, died at the, in 90s. So I'm okay. Um, well, they were lucky, really. So you might need skills like motivational interviewing. So, um, and that's an offer. And Paul will just talk about it at the end. We've got an offer for people that want to attend and, and try and support patients. Um, um, we, we were able to plug you in into, into the relevant um, criteria. So the next slide, please. Okay, this is just a quick um, sort of run through about why is it that we are trying to control um, diabetes, okay? So we, we classify the um, factors into macrovascular. So, so with diabetes, it can affect the blood vessels, yeah? So it can make the blood vessels like blood pressure, stiff, thick, blocked, clogged. So if the big blood vessels, which are the macro vessels can be, um, are affected, you can get things like stroke, um, heart attacks, heart failures, peripheral vascular disease, that means the arteries in the legs are uh, affected and they can get uh, what we call the claudication pain. It's basically having a heart attack in the leg essentially, so they get, get pain as they walk. You can then microvascular, microvascular is pretty much that they can, it can affect the kidneys, the foot, foot also could be in a way macro as well, the eye, and it can affect peripheral autonomic neuropathy. By that I mean that these are autom autonomic nerves. So you know if I if, I'm, uh, if I suddenly stand up, my heart rate um, would automatically be adjust, adjusted, okay? The, the bowel in a patient is moving automatically, and these are all autonomic nerves. So if the autonomic nerves are affected, and actually there is evidence that with complication, the first bit to get affected is autonomic nerves. So you can get patients getting dizzy as they stand up. And if you remember who people who attended the hypertension pathway, I said, that you do a postural blood pressure check in patients with diabetes over 80 or who are feeling dizzy, because that may be an indication that they've got autonomic neuropathy. The other things are the pulse. So you pulse is racing, you're tachycardic, so you're in a heart rate, or you get bowel symptoms, a lot of bloating and bowel issues, you get bladder issues, because all the internal organs, you don't have to tell your bowel to move, you, know, you don't have to tell your bladder to do what it needs to do, it's automatically happening. So once that starts getting affected, you can get these symptoms. So just so you to be aware of, and I know it's a low risk pathway, but a patient may mention this to you, 
you need to think, are they having those, you know, are they having that complication? And of course, I put ED, erectile dysfunction. In my experience, a lot of men, particularly if they're seeing somebody from opposite sex, are not really forthcoming with this history. Um, so you might need to use um, other skills to get the information because actually, again, this is a really, really early sign and there is help because it can cause them depression and you know, relationship issues, et cetera. So erectile dysfunction, commonly associated. And actually more and more um, research that's been done, it's now um, a, a, you know, evident that it's not um, just men that suffer, but actually women, it is associated, poor control is associated with low libido as well. So I'm not going to go much into the details, but I'm just saying that they may expect sexual dysfunction. There are some associations as well that you need to be aware of. The dyslipidemia, diabetes dyslipidemia, especially if they've got that sort of metabolic spike syndrome, so they may have abnormal cholesterol levels, uh, particularly the tri you know, horrible cholesterol ones. On the foot, I mentioned the vascular and the nerves. The foot problem as a complication is a combination that the nerves are not sort of, uh, the nerves are affected and the blood vessels that carries the blood and infection and clear things off isn't, isn't uh, working as well. Yeah, and I've mentioned about depression to you guys as well, so do check that. I'm just gonna, uh, just to DKN and, and uh, sort of the, um, the, uh, uh, the other sort of complication, um, hypothematic sort of um, um, complication, not, uh, it's not something I hope you would come across because you'll be doing the low risk, but just be aware if the patient tells you that their blood sugars are in the 30s. They're really feeling unwell. They've got those sort of diabetic symptoms. They're losing weight. You're thinking you should start thinking red flags. And you need to then make sure that they go into the relevant, linked into the relevant pathway for um, uh, whatever your PCN has decided. So these patients may come and talk to you about that. Um, I, I haven't mentioned here, but also if they tell you they're having hypos, which is a level less than four, that is also something that you need to signpost them to the medium and high risk group, so you need to get help. So this is for your awareness. You're not doing anything about this in the low risk pathway, but except if you're signposting, so you need to be aware that this may happen. And just to recap, the symptoms that you would be checking for them uh, would be, um, had they got not just about the complications as in strokes, heart attacks, you know, but have they got a pain in the legs when they walk, have they got a problem with the bowel bladder? Or have they got erectile dysfunction? Have they got numbness in the needle in the feet? Do they check their feet? And is there a depression? And what are the blood sugar levels? Okay. Ideally, blood sugar levels between five and seven. And actually, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move on to the next uh, slide, actually, because I'm just speaking too much on the slide. Um, I, I'm gonna just chunk and check here. If anyone's got any questions so far, our points of clarification. So just to recap, we have gone through the annual review and the annual review would include, um, well, and, and diagnosis as well. You would discuss the diagnosis and you would revisit an annual review, but also you'll be looking for complication. You're doing, you know, you're doing the lifestyle bit, signposting to DVLA, you know, you're talking about depression, you're looking at ED, you're looking at any other symptoms, you're checking, uh, you know, um, checking for their medication, how they're uh, ordering it, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I hope that bit is clear. I'm just gonna give you 15 seconds to either ask, come through, ask, or um, put in the chat function if you've got any, any questions so far. And there's a lot of information, but it is recorded, so hopefully you'll be able to watch. Um, and, um, and as you're doing the work, it's the best way to learn is on the job. So no questions are coming through. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Right, so just a bit about diet. I'm not a dietitian, however, just so you are aware uh, that the, the patients will, um, you know, it's, it's nice to just know what the patients are eating. And actually what I do is with the diet, I just tell them what you have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you could quite quickly work out if they've got large portions, or if they've got mainly carbohydrate-based meals, yeah? So a lot of rice parties and you know, all, all those sort of meals, you can quite easily and quickly work out. But do remember the hidden sugars. So ask them how much and which type of fruit they eat and um, what is the juices, fruit juices. Do they have any fruit juices? 
Um, and actually, I had a patient, remember this young chap who came to us and sugars were just really all over the place. And it turned out actually he was having watermelon juice because his aunt in India had told him that's the only way you can control blood sugars by having watermelon juice. And of course, the sugars were like all over the place. So that's the, when we say, you know, the hidden sugars are in, not just in the meals, they're having it elsewhere. Ask them about snacks. What is it, you know, what is it they eat and snack in between the meals? So do get that from them. And that's a brief intervention to say, actually it looks like you're eating too much or no, you need a bit of support. I'm going to signpost you. And there is a concept of what we call as a glycemic index source. So when we say glycemic index, so, uh, uh, so carbs with high glycemic index, what they do is they give you a spike. So you eat them, they give you quick sugar. So your sugar will suddenly shoot up and then come down. Whereas low glycemic index, it will shoot up, but not there. It will shoot up slightly and then remain in a sort of plateaued. So those are the kind of carbohydrates that we prefer, which is the whole grain, you know, the, um, the couscous and the pulses. So those are the things that we would um, prefer in the diet. We are doing a dietetic session. And Paul, if you could just share with this group, the dietary, um, all the obesity workers, I think it would really benefit the low risk. So we're running a, a bespoke diet, um, diabetes diet session uh, next couple of weeks, not remember the day before we share out with you. So do attend that. We've got a dietitian that's speaking on there. A bit more about the dietary intervention. Um, I, and um, again, Diabetes UK uh, has got some lovely resources actually. So do sign for us, lots of this in different languages as well. Um, and you can ask your estimate if needed. Of course, alcohol in limit. And do remember alcohol, it's got a funny effect in diabetes. It can either shoot it, the sugars up because it delays the um, digestion of the carbohydrate or it can drop it. So it can go either way. Especially if you've had alcohol, you've done exercise, you've had the same amount of food, you're on insulin, it's likely your sugars will drop. But sometimes you've got to become Sherlock Holmes and get that out of the patient, really. Okay. Uh, but again, I don't expect you to do that. Be alert. And if you ask the questions, and if something is not sounding right, then please uh, sign post. And do remember that, you know, you talk about the calorie foods, they've got low calories. So it's, it's, it's great. So, you know, the, there's a difference between glycemic index and calories. So if you want to lose weight, then you need to have low calorie food in addition to low glycemic index food. Because say avocado, um, it's got the good fat in it. The calories will be high. So, you know, you get full. So you won't necessarily lose weight with that, but it's got the good fat in it. Do you, do you see what I mean? So, but we'll talk about that in the dietary session. And I don't want to say too much here. I've got a habit of becoming too medical. So I will stop at this point. But just to say, just be aware of what, and, and this is all nice. This is not made up. This is nice. You also talk about smoking within that, for obvious reasons. Um, and I've said to you, if you're hypertensive, um, if you are, um, if you've got, if you're a smoker and you've got high blood pressure, you are a ticking time bomb. So just, um, just, just be aware of that. But it's not the diabetes we need to control. We need to control the risk factors. Yeah, and actually some of the risk factors are more of a worry than diabetes itself. Okay, next slide, um, please, Paul, thank you. This is a bit about exercise. Again, I'm not gonna say too much, except to just tell patients, and it'll be quite obvious um, when you speak to them that, that they you know, spend time not doing much exercises. Um, there, there are sort of, um, you can sign post them to the local, local social subscriber if you're lucky enough to have a piece of workers in your um, sort of um, team and signpost to them, but have a clear pathway who goes there. But equally for patients that want, you can use the Diabetes UK resource, okay? And again, just the point that the patients may say to you, my blood sugar goes low when I exercise. Well, that's fine because you're burning it off. But those patients, if they're having it recurrently dropping, they might need change in medication, those adjustments. So please signpost them um, to the relevant clinician within that CCM. Thanks, Paul, for putting that through. Um, next slide, please. Paul, oh, thank you. Okay, I've already talked to you about a diagnosis, what you do. And this is just a bit about annual review. And again, a lot of things are not in quash. Um, they are nice. And, but the expectation here is 
um, that you will again explain the diagnosis. Again, it might be a patient who says, I know it, in which case you don't have to do anything. So just be guided by who you've got in front of you. I'm not going to go into much detail, but the, the first one is pretty much BMI, smoking, alcohol. BP, remember, they're diabetic. So you've got to do a postural drop. If they haven't been referred for education, refer them. But do bear in mind if you feel when you've done a review that actually their diet is really poor and they would benefit from dietetic review, you can still refer them to the local dietary team. Um, eye screening, they already have a call and report, but um, just check if they've had that. Or check, one would do. Uh, obviously, uh, you require uh, skills and training. We are in the process of setting some training for those people that want to be trained on foot check, if you could contact uh, Paul and I, and we can plug you into um, the training there as well. Of course, I've mentioned about the blood test. I've told you about the urine ACR. I mentioned contraception. I've told you poor diabetes control is linked with fetal abnormalities, discourage them for, um, from getting pregnant until the HbA1c. And actually, recent guidance is actually the best pregnancy outcome is with an HbA1c of 6.1, actually even non-diabetic kind of range, and give them five milligram of folic acid, not 400. These patients require higher folic acid. Uh, reiterate driving travel prescriptions, check if they've got depression, ED, and I mentioned to you about the autonomic. So if they have got resting pulses high, they're getting complication, not much you can do about that really, but if they're not getting palpitations, you don't need to do anything. They might get bowel problems, bladder problems. There is help there. So there are some drugs that can be given to those as well. Of course, there are drugs for ED. Curious them. Curious them every year because they might be. And again, it's slightly controversial as somebody who does diabetes a lot. I personally feel everybody should be on a statin. But I'm talking to you about what NICE is saying. NICE is still saying curious them. But Quas is saying have their um, cholesterol less than five. So to two sort of opposing views there. Okay, I've told you about the identity card. The only two things in red that you would do at annual review that may not necessarily what you do at, uh, at diagnosis is checking the side effects of medication and also checking the self-monitoring reading, okay? And the bit you would also do is if they have, uh, if they are on insulin is to check for lumps. So if you see this photo, this is what insulin lumps look like. And often they are better seen than felt. And if you're not sure, ask the patient to stand on the side and have a look from the side and you see the bulges. And they're often not symmetrical as they are. This patient is obviously injecting left and right uh, on equal basis, but often you'll see lumps which are not symmetrical. And as I said, you would see them better than you can feel. Now, what happens is if they are have got lumps and they're injecting these lumps, insulin sitting there for longer, it's not being absorbed or it's being absorbed in a delayed fashion. So if, uh, if so, the sugars will be basically all over the place. So they need to rotate. They need to stop injecting here. And it just will take at least six, nine months to recover. And they start injecting on other sites like arms and legs. And just to reiterate, they go around the umbilical area. They can inject the arm, arms, upper uh, area of the thigh and outer area of the thigh. And uh, so it might be just worth checking for those uh, for lumps as well. So I'm just going to chunk and check here and see if anybody has got any uh, questions so far. Anything anybody wants to ask? Just put in your questions there. And as I said, please do ask because it's the, it's the, um, time that you would um you know this is the time to ask the question essentially okay so nothing Paul let's just move on to the next um slide please I just wanted to put this cross requirement out there just so you're aware but um just again agree within the pathway what the PCM would like you to do so of course they just want you to maintain a register of patients with diabetes they put blood pressure they got two blood pressure targets which is 150.90 and 140.90, and you get different points for that. You haven't got ACR anymore, but what you have is that if the patient has been diagnosed as having uh, diabetes, so they've got basically proteins, they should be on an A. So they're looking at number of patients who have got ACR positive and that are treated with an ACE or ARB inhibitor. Okay? So do you remember the hypertension guidelines that if your blood pressure is high, if you're diabetic, you go on an ACE, and if you're acetylcholine, it's the ARB that works better. 
They've also got this, which is why I was saying to you, it's like confusion with quas and nice, is what they're saying is your cholesterol should be um, less than five. Then they've got three diabetic ranges, which is 59, 64, and 75. And then you've got the foot check, uh, and they don't have a check in terms of sensation pulses. You've got risk assessment, medium, low, and high risk. And I'll just talk to you about that in a minute. You've also got people having flu jab. And then the last bit is about the um, patients who had the Q risk um, done, essentially. And um, they are treated with a statin. So patients with high Q risk, over 10% that are on statin. Then again, statin is patients who've already had a stroke. Uh, treated with statin and smoking this. So this is what a quaff requirement is. And I'm telling you this because you might see alerts coming out in your um, sort of box on the side of your screen telling you uh, slightly different to what the pathway is telling you. But just bear that in mind that it essentially is all amalgamated. Next slide, please, Paul. Paul, can I have the next slide, please? Okay. This is a really quick thing about targets. So uh, you need to repeat three to six monthly the HbA1c until you reach the target. And the target is for HbA1c, and this is purely the diabetic target I'm looking at, that you do it three to six monthly until you reach the target of 48 or 53. So essentially, if you are being managed, a diet control, you want a HbA1c of um, 48, if you are on a single drug, then also we want 48, except if you're on a drug that causes hypoglycemia, in which case we raise it to 53. So there are some drugs that drop your blood sugar too much. So we want to try and maintain the HbA1c slightly higher in these patients because if we control it too tight, they will drop the blood sugar and have a hypo, which would be even, even worse, detrimental. Okay, so this is your HbA1c target. Next slide, please, Paul. This is your blood pressure target, which is pretty much based on the NICE hypertension guidance, which you should know, which is under 80, less than 140, 90. Take five off if you're doing it at home or ambulatory. If you're over 80, below 150, 90, take five off if you're going to do ambulatory or home, okay? However, and I mentioned to you this at the hypertension meeting as well, if you've got kidney disease, the range is slightly less because actually if you've got diabetes and hypertension, the chances of your kidneys getting worse are a lot higher than having one condition on its own. So we actually need to reduce the blood pressure to less than 130, um, 80. Um, so again, just bear that in mind. So diabetic with kidney disease, blood pressure lower. If you're just diabetic, it's the usual hypertension sort of um, um, guidance um, as you would do with any other hypertension. Next slide, please, Paul. This is a cholesterol tab, um, target, okay? The so NICE is saying that you've got a tumor. Now, if you've already got a heart problem, you've already had a stroke, you've already got a complication, then you should be on a power stat in 80. If you are, um, haven't had it and your tumor is tiny, you've got to start something for primary prevention, you should be on 20 milligrams of a power statin. And I'm telling you this because you need to just check the patients in a high, uh, on the adequate dose, because you will find sometimes that the patients are on 10 milligrams of a provostatin. This really should be on 20 or 80, depending on whether they've had a heart problem or not. When you start somebody on statin, what you're looking for is a reduction 40% of known HDL. Not for the low risk group, it's really for the medium and high risk because they are the ones that will be making the changes. But I just wanted to put it out there that they may be on a higher dose of atorvastatin, more than 20 for primary prevention, because they haven't had that 40% reduction in non-HDL. And I'm not talking about cholesterol today, but I just wanted you to be aware of the dose. The dose is not 10 milligrams of atorvastatin, actually a large number from the order to the and BHR are still on uh, suboptimal doses. So do remember 20, 80 could be higher than 20, but it, should be, it will be based on the reduction on non-HDL. So I'm just going to chunk and check again in terms of targets. And just to reiterate, the HbA1c is 48 or 53. 53 for patients that are on drugs that will drop the sugars too much. The blood pressure target, you do 114, you know, less than 140, 90, under 80, 115, 90, over 80 and less. 
and um, over 80, sorry. Um, and if you are got kidney disease, it's less than 130, um, 80. Um, for cholesterol, we said you do a Q risk. Q risk is high, you start them on a statin 20 milligrams. You keep increasing the statin until you get a 40% reduction in non HDL. For people that already have a heart or heart attack, stroke, already have a vascular event, you need to be on a, a lower statin 80. And just to reiterate also, I haven't put a slide that actually aspirin is out of fashion now. So they don't need to be on aspirin just because they're diabetic. They can be on aspirin for other reasons, but just because they've got diabetes uh, and complications, they don't need to be on aspirin. Okay, so the next slide, please, Paul. So no questions, so that's great. I just wanted to talk to you about a bit about foot care. Because actually in being, uh, I think in BHR, we've got a high um, sort of um, 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 amputation rate, higher than um, the rest of the country. So it's just so people are aware. So when you see um, somebody for annual review, just check if they've got a previous ulcer and amputation, because that automatically puts them at high risk. Okay, so you don't even have to ask any other questions. If they've had a previous ulcer and amputation, they are high risk, yeah? But for patients that are not had that, you've got to check if they're having claudication pain. And when I say claudication pain, a pain in the car that comes when they walk, which stops when they um, stop walking. That means that their blood vessels are long. It's not just having angina in the heart. When you walk, you get chest pain because the arteries are blocked. Similarly in the leg, it's having angina in the leg. So claudication pain, have they got numbness? Who cuts the nail and how do they cut it? Do they examine the feet? So these are the questions you're going to check when you're checking the low risk. Use, use an examine. So just do remember, foot check is not just about quickly checking the pulse and quickly checking the sensation. This is about looking at the foot, having a look at the nails. Have they got ingrained toenails? Have they got toes that need cutting? Have they got skin dryness? And do remember when the nerves are affected, the first thing in the skin happens is your skin becomes really dry. Are the arches okay? Have they got flat feet? Do they need support with that? Then you check the pulsing sensations. Just check the shoes. Are they wearing the right shoes? Or have they got corns because they're wearing the wrong fitting you know, shoes? Or they've got bunions? So just check for all that. ABP, I've mentioned ABP. This is to check for pressure on the leg, but obviously not everybody will have the skills. But if you find when you've done the pulse, you either can't feel the pulse or it feels feeble, then they may need a, a, um, a pressure check. And that um, a lot of the nurses within the practices would do that. And see if they've got any deformity. Have they got claw toes? Have they got any deformity in the foot that needs addressing, that needs referral to the podiatry team? Once you've done all that, you stratify. You then get a low risk, you get a moderate risk, and a high risk. For low risk, you just educate. You just say, examine your feet, uh, toe cutting, you know, um, a cream, moisturize. And actually, there's again on Diabetes UK, lovely leaflets about self-care. And there are some videos that are coming out as well. And you just bring them back uh, annually. For moderate foot, now this is where there is a commissioning deficiency, which is we are now currently um, trying to fill. We're trying to commission this pathway. For moderate foot, uh, once you've stratified that, uh, you need to review, uh, the patient needs to be reviewed by the foot service in six to eight weeks. And you review them in three to six months. However, there is a commissioning back gap at the moment. So we are just, you know, the, I think primary care, which is why the amputation rates are slightly high in BHR because the rest of the world has got a service we don't and we are trying to bridge that gap. If they're high risk, you need to be referred within two to four weeks and follow up in one to two weeks or four weeks, depending on what they found at the hospital. But this is not something the, the primary care should be sitting on. This is something you need to move on there is a foot clinic being set up. In fact, it has been set up at the trust. And if people don't have the referral pathway, I can get um, diabetes team to share. So you can refer high risk foot to this pathway where they should be seen quite quickly. You know, you've got those infections, those charcoals. The charcoals needs to go in immediately, really, but the infections and other bits, you know, early ulcer developing, they need to be going into the foot pathway. So just be careful about the foot. I have actually seen a patient who was spelling, and when I looked at the foot, they had the worst maggot-filled ulcer that I've ever seen, and the patient didn't even know it. They couldn't check the foot. 
their sensations have gone, so they had no pain. The blood supply and obviously the pulses were gone. So that, that patient was extremely high risk. And because of the smell, I just happened to look at the foot or something that comes a completely different thing. And she had no idea. So that's the scary stories, you know, some of the providers will tell you as well. So just bear that in mind. And the, uh, we are going to be running some podiatry sort of training sessions and foot sessions as well. So uh, just, um, just keep checking on the BHR um, C10 website and Paul will obviously share with the clinical leads as well. The next slide, please, Paul. I just wanted to put this out there, but I don't expect the people to remember this. Um, but just to say that if you are um, on insulin, you've got to inform DVLA. If you are non-insulin treatment, but if you've got complications from diabetes, you've got to inform DVLA. Uh, but the rules are different for lorry drivers. So actually find out what the car they drive or what do they drive um, and just sign post them. And I put the link here uh, for the DVLA, a really good leaflet. And actually, uh, the more you read them yourself with the patient, the more you would remember. So I don't want you to get too bogged down by the DVLA guidance, except remember to tell them that they've got to inform DVLA um, if there's a complication or if they go on insulin. Um, and if they're lorry drivers, it's even more stringent for criteria. They've got to stop and check um, you know, um, their sugars, uh, et cetera. So I'm, I'm not going to say much here, except that actually there, there is really good sites there with patients and release less. Okay, next slide, please, Paul. Now, this is just a quick thing about personalization, personalizing diabetes care. So I've talked to you about the targets, right? But you've got to look at the patient and personalize the test. If you've got a patient who, so I'm just going to give you some examples. So I had a patient who was a dancer, and that's what her, you know, that's what she did for a living. And so her diabetes control, um, of course, I wanted to, you know, make her HB1C around 48. But every time I tried to increase the medication to try and um, get to that level, she would have a hypo um, because she was dancing. That was a job. So we had to agree that actually for her, we will have a slightly higher target. So we agreed that she doesn't get a high for 58. So we stuck to that level, that we're actually going to have a higher level. So that's what I mean by personalizing diabetes care. Equally, if you've got a patient who's extremely um, obese and you're going to say to them, go and exercise, just bear uh, that in mind. They're going to go out of the room and go back to the usual way. So they may need some motivational. They may need smaller steps. They may need, you know, a more targeted approach and more regular follow-up uh, to really get to that stage. So this is what I mean by personalizing diabetes care. So the targets are adjusted based on the patient in front of you. You do not take a target and say, here's your target. Achieve it in three months and I'll see you in three months. No, you negotiate, share that with the patient and agree a shared care. And that's the basic bit about personalizing care, not just diabetes care, personalizing care. Okay. Um, so uh, again, I've got a lorry driver who does not want to go on insulin at all because he has got five kids that he's got to look after. And he says, if I go on insulin, I'm going to lose my job and I cannot, I need to work for another two years. So we've had to agree with him to put him on, on therapies, quadruple therapy for diabetes, which is not licensed, but it is fitting his life. He's taken on the responsibility. We've had a shared understanding and we are happy to review it back when he's ready to go on insulin. So this is where I mean personalizing diabetes care. And I'm telling you that for the low risk pathway simply because if a patient tells you they're having difficulty, make sure you try and become sure at home and find out what's happening there, okay? Chip away, find out, and then you can put them into the relevant pathway, having a discussion with the clinician to say, can we consider adjusting their target? Okay, so this is a personalization concept. Next slide, please, Paul. I'm going to just stop there for two um, secs to see if there's any questions so far, um, anything anyone wants to know comment on or um, feedback, anything. Okay, there's nothing in the chat function. No one's coming forward. So just point, uh, you know, just ask if you need to. Okay. So again, I'm just, this is the low risk part, so I'm not going to go into the details of management, but just to let you know, the management is lifestyle, 
So a lot of patients with type 2 diabetes are not on medication, which is fine because they have managed to adjust the lifestyle and managed to maintain all the parameters. However, there will be patients who go on drugs. And just a quick view about the drugs. Next slide, please, Paul. So these are the drug groups that you would normally hear of. Metformin, I'm sure people have, most of the people here would have heard of metformin. Metformin can make you feel a bit nauseous. So if the patient says, oh yeah, I've come for my review, but I feel a bit sick. My, I've got, you know, my bowels don't feel right. It's a common side effect. And they can be then put on slow release metformin. So you be aware, so you can then discuss with the medium high risk group people, okay? Clitazide, which, are, uh, which is again a common drug. It's, it's the SU drug commonly causes hypoglycemia, so blood sugar less than four. Be aware, if the patient is telling you that I'm getting low readings, they may need either stopping or adjustment of the glycoside. Again, sign both. okay? We've got a group called SGLTs. They work on the kidneys by throwing the sugars out, okay? The sugar, bacteria love it, so they cause infections, okay? There's also risk of DKA, which means that patients can become quite unwell initially when they start on it. So if you've got a patient that you're doing an annual review and they say to you, I've been put on a new drug, and if you Google that drug and think, oh, it's an SGLT, they're feeling unwell, they're feeling sick, they're getting the blood sugar even higher, think CKA, sign post immediately on the day, speak to somebody. You've got another group of drugs which used to be injectable, now it comes in a tablet form, it's called GLP, massively you know associated with weight loss but really good drugs as as it is GLT for that matter but if the patient say they've had tummy ache there's a link with pancreatitis and thyroid cancer so if they complain of sort of um a lump in the in the in the neck which is not going to feel right again just so you guys are aware of it you know it's not a common thing you probably won't see anybody but I just wanted you to be aware of the side effects you've got PPQ regulators which are, affect the weight uh, the glycosomes also affect the weight. They also persist with heart failures and fractures. Insulin, of course, hypos. I just wanted to put this slide there. I'm not expecting you to um, have a sort of great big discussion. And if you don't remember, it's easy on the um, on uh, EMIS on your drug screen. You've got a drug information. Just read the side effect and see if there is. And if there is, go and speak to the medium and high risk people say what you should do about these, but also be aware that patients have got a history previously of pancreatitis, for example, and they are on GLP, you need to be slightly aware. Yeah, you need to make sure somebody is aware if they've had previous thyroid cancer, or if they've got heart failure and you see that this patient is on glitazone, you know, um, and, and that, that will come as you see more and more patients. I'm not expecting you to, you know, immediately jump into that. So just so you be aware. Okay, just going to chunk and check again. Any questions? There's nothing in the chat function. Any questions so far? Anyone? I can see Anne's joined. Lovely to see your name, Anne. Okay, I'm going to just move on to the next slide. Please. Again, I just wanted to run through some red flags. So I've, I, again, this will not be surprising because we've, we've kind of covered this as we've moved along. For the foot, if you see a swollen, Foot with fallen arches, which weren't fallen before, red skin ulcer, you, they, these patients need help now. If a patient's telling you every day they're getting readings less than four, they need to get help now. And remember, some of these patients, they can show you a blood sugar reading. They've lost, because the autonomic nerves are not working anymore, they've lost the hypo awareness. So they actually don't even know they're getting a hypo. That's how they go into diabetic coma. So if you see the blood sugar reading, and the readings are constantly threes and twos. You're thinking, oh my God, I'm, this patient needs help now. Go and speak to somebody. And remember, ideal readings between five and seven, but you can have a personalized target and you're, you know, you're running slightly higher, but ideal level between five and seven. Symptoms of diabetes ketoacidosis, they smell of ketone, yeah? They've got the fruity smell too, you know, in the breath. They're confused, they're getting tummy ache, they feel unwell. So if you see somebody on an annual review and they're complaining of that, you're thinking there's something happening and the blood sugar is over 30, you think, oh God, this is something happening. Equally, you can get another complication, HHS as we call it, if they're patients not eating, drinking, um, and not, not passing urine, you need to get help. You just need to be aware there might be something evolving. 
they should specifically warm a thing over two hours. You think there's something happening. It's probably, if, if it's not happening and they've just got a viral bug, they still need to follow the six day rules, which is not for this um, sort of this um, group, but you need to sign post them to the media and hire those people. Have loss of vision, that's an obvious. In anybody who suddenly lose their vision, that's a red flag. And if they've got diabetes, kidney disease, and you know you see that they haven't passed urine, that means they're going into renal failure. So then the kidneys are not producing any urine, it's just staying in the blood. That becomes emergency again. You need to just speak to the medium high risk people, and these people might need to go into the hospital. So just some of the red flags that I've pointed out there, just so you are aware of these. Okay. The next slide, please, Paul. Now this is um, just a um, thing that um, um, that UCLP have um, put on, um, just for you to remember what you need to cover. However. I think the slide that I showed you at diagnosis at an annual review, probably better. I wanted to put uh, this because UCLP has spent a lot of time energy doing this, but it pretty much covers everything except a few more things that I mentioned to you about, you know, erectile dysfunction, having bowel bladder symptoms. Just check for that if they're having any other symptoms and the red flags, but there are more red flags than I've discussed before. But I just wanted to put it out there for people that are just starting off, they want to put some, stick something on the wall and what they need to do. Um, but um, really, ideally, it should be that annual um, check that I showed you before, but you could start off with this um, as when you see the patients on an annual basis. Next slide, please, Paul. Okay, just a bit about the target. Um, please do share the target with the patient. Do tell them that we are aiming for a blood sugar between you know, six and seven or five and eight or whatever the targets are, and that should be in their notes. I don't expect the low risk group to create these targets, but you need to tell them uh, that should have been decided by high and medium risk group. And there should be a target sort of list to say you should have a blood sugar of this, blood pressure of this, um, a cholesterol of this. You should be exercising you know, three times. You should, your diet should include this and when to contact surgery. So this is their personalized plan essentially. Okay. Recreate that through the patient because unless they are self empowered, it's less likely they will engage. And I'm finding more and more every time I'm telling patients your, you know, your home blood pressure reading should be this. I'm getting more and more calls to say, actually, now I've gone beyond. And they now know that they've got to do it for a week before they contact me. And I'm now encouraging them to even work out the average and tell me if the average is above, then contact me. So slowly, as you know, patients, they would be contacting you. So they don't then contact you at one off reading of a blood sugar of eight or nine they're looking at that pattern, okay? And again, I don't expect you guys to set that, the high and medium risk should have, and that target then should be ideally in a practice, either at your rec or in a PC and you decide how you wanna do it, whether you have a little uh, a plan or you know, um, um, for, for the patient or a leaflet or whatever. So there's various ways of doing it and I'll let the PC decide that. So next slide, please, Paul. I'm just going to sign both you um, to the local resources. So I've mentioned to you about the pre-diabetes patients who are not yet diabetes, who you risk assess, that you can refer to the National Diabetes Prevention Program. And we've got Anne Baldwin, who's here as the lead of National Diabetes Prevention Program. So do refer, do refer these patients, simple form, thick book form. And there was a self-referral self option as well, which again, I can share the uh, link with the CD leads on how the patient can self-refer. But it's actually a really simple form. You now have got patients who are obese who actually be installed on the digital weight management service. So again, you're getting alerts on your, um, on your system. You've got exercise and prescriptions locally. Diabetes UK, a really fantastic resource. And as a PCN, contact your local Diabetes UK champions and see who are and what support they can do. We often run a, um, a, a, a sort of a, a open day um, for patients to sort of come in and the Diabetes UK team is there to go through what's on offer and how they can get involved. I mentioned to you about the IAP services, it's a self-referral, and please, please, please check. I've told you that it's a high, a large number of diabetics are also depressed, and that will impact their self-management, so do refer them and get them help for the IAP. If you yourself need some skill building in terms of the motivational interviewing, et cetera, uh, then um, uh, do contact us. But also just for the PC and CDs, if anyone is there, that please try and within the pathway decide 
the role for the personal care practitioners, right? If they are doing the um, just agree the pathway, so whoever's doing the low risk pathway, if they find compliance an issue, you know, the health and well being is an issue that's impacting, then there needs to be a referral pathway to the PCP workers. And it's a fantastic result, the PCP workers really is. Um, that can try and help with that population health, um, not just that, but also with some of the diabetics who need a bit more sort of one-to-one, -one, bit of more motivation and target setting, et cetera. So they, they were a fantastic results, really. Um, next slide, um, please, Paul. Okay, right. So case studies, now you're gonna have to participate and Anne, you're not allowed to speak, um, so. Can I just ask you guys, you can use the chat function for those people who don't want to say anything, but I want you to think about this. You've got a 59 year old who's come for an annual review. She um, is on insulin and she tells you her blood sugars are between five and six. Are you happy with these readings? Yes, no. The known diabetic on insulin and you're doing an annual review and she, she's saying, actually, her, you know, you ask her what sugars and she's saying between five and six. Are we happy? Can people just put something in the chat function? Mahi? Catherine, Marco, Aris? I mean, I just put something. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, Marco, that's fine. You may want more readings, but she's giving you. So when they bring you um, the readings, um, and again, it depends on who the patient is, uh, that their target, and that's the point I was trying to get, it may be the right target for her, right? But you look at what her target was. Ideally, this is a very good reading. Perfect, yeah? You would want more, absolutely, but you may want to look at what was an agreed target for her because she could be a 51 year old who is extremely frail, in which case we need to run slightly higher targets. So those of you who said we need more information or um, uh, that it depends, absolutely, it depends. But ideal reading is between five and seven, but you personalize it, absolutely, okay? The next slide, please. Paul. And again, please do answer the case studies because otherwise um, um, you, uh, you won't be awake. Okay, this is a 65 year old who attends a routine blood pressure check. He's not known to have diabetes. And he asks you whether he should have a diabetic check. And just to give you a background, he is um, um, Afro-Caribbean. That should probably give you, give that away. So what would you say to him? He's 65 and he's asking you, should he have diabetic check? So do you remember what we discussed about screening? Who should, who should be screened? Yep, some more answers. Yeah, yeah. So remember what I said, for everyone over the age of 40, if you're 25 and over, if you've got, if you've, um, got risk factors, if you're none of the other groups, then you get um, diabetes screening. Yeah, so he gets, um, he gets then screened if he's in not in any of those factors. Otherwise, everybody else gets screened. Okay, so, those of you who said, yes, he would need one, absolutely he would need one. He's out for Caribbean, he's over 40. I don't need to do a risk assessment on him. I just need to do a check on him. The risk assessment of people who don't fit into the criteria of symptomatic, um, they are um, not over 40. They haven't got any other risk factors. So you would then do a risk assessment on these people. Do you remember that pre-diabetes slide that I showed you, yeah? Okay, right, the next case, please. So well done there, guys. So this is the third person. We've got a 59 year old with type 2 diabetes who's got HbA1c of 6.8, a cholesterol of 5.2, okay? What would you do? So is his diabetic control good? So I put down this, uh, so less, in the old money, this is, uh, you know, this is less than 50 HbA1c. I put the old sort of um, thing. The diabetic control of 6.8. 6.8 is about, I would, I would say about 49.50. Okay. 
So he's already diabetic. So is the HbA1c under control, yes or no? So those of you saying he's not got good control, actually that HbA1c is really good. He's got good control. Um, we are aiming for um, this sort of level, less than seven, ideally for HbA1c, around 48. That's the perfect reading, okay? So this is about 49, that's fine. Uh, we won't change anything at this level, that's fine. So the level is acceptable. What about the cholesterol? Is that good? Yeah, absolutely, Nikki, well done. We do a few risk on this patient. Yeah, absolutely, well done, Nikki. So remember I said to you, there's a slight discrepancy between what Knight and Quoff are saying. So Knight is saying, Q risk them, you know, Q risk over 10, uh, put them on a statin. Quoff is saying, maintain the cholesterol less than um, five or less. So slight discrepancy, um, but just speak to your PC and CDs and see what. As a diabetology person, I would say everybody needs, everybody with diabetes probably needs a, a statin, um, but that's my personal view. Um, but just be guided um, by what your local uh, policy and protocol would be. So you would absolutely cure risk this person um, and, um, and, and, and yeah, put the most statin over there. So Amina, it's really easy. There are conversion tools, Amina, on the, um, if you just Google conversion, there are conversion tools. It's really, really easy um, to look at. There is a formula, but I'm not going to confuse you with the formula. All I will say is just go on online and, and you would get the conversion. Okay. So thanks, Pat. Uh, well, hold next slide, please. Okay. So now you've got a 55 year old with the following result, not known diabetic. Okay. So this uh, reading is um, around 47. Okay. So in the new money, it's about 47. Okay, those of you who want to convert. This is a 55 year old, and you've just come across some results. He's not known to have diabetes, but he's got the HbA1c of 6.4 in the old money, about 47 in the new money. What would you do? Well done, Amina. Fantastic. Absolutely. Do you remember what I said? 42 to 47 is pre diabetic, and you need to refer them to NDPP. National Diabetes Prevention Program. And it's, there's a simple form, yeah, absolutely. And they, they would let them do the lifestyle and diet. You, you refer these people, okay? And just put them on the free diabetes at high risk of diabetes register because they need an annual diabetic check because the conversion rate uh, from free diabetes diabetes is 50%, which is the highest of any conditions from pre to actually the condition. So absolutely, we would, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, repeat HP1 six months if they've had, yeah, you can repeat it in six months, but you need to put them on an annual recall. So if you've found that they've gone to NDPP and they've changed the lifestyle, they want it, you can do it, fine. But ideally, definitely in a year's time. Okay, next slide, please, Paul. So well done for people that are participating. Please do carry on with your answers. Okay, so this is a 69-year-old who uh, was diagnosed started on metformin. She tells you that she is bloated. What would you do? Again, she comes to see you for the annual review and she's saying, oh my God, I was starting on metformin. I'm just feeling a bit bloated. I've just got a tummy sort of doesn't feel right. What would one do? What would you as the low risk um, uh, in charge do? Yeah, absolutely, Marco. Yeah, Nikki, well done. Yes, Amina, it absolutely is a side effect. Yeah, so this is the right answer, Catherine. I want you to be aware that that's a side effect and I want you to go and speak to the medium and high risk people who in all probabilities will change them into a slow release form, a modified release form, which is slightly more friendly to the tummy. Uh, so all the answers are right, but as a low risk group in charge, I would signpost and you know, have a chat with the GP as to what to do. Yeah, so all the answers are right. So really, really well done. And Amina, well done for recognizing. And, sh and actually you might, you know, because some of the, these the GI side effects, they can last for two weeks and go away. So a lot of patients actually only get it um, for the first few weeks and then the uh, first couple of weeks and then they're okay. So that might well be that they just need some reassurance. But 
you're not giving them reassurance because they could have something else wrong. You need to go to the medium high risk. So next slide, please, Paul. So well done there, guys. Okay, so this is case six. You've got a 72 year old who's known diabetic on triple therapy. When I say on triple therapy, he's on three different medications for diabetes. He comes in saying that he's not really feeling well. He's drinking too much. He's got tummy aches. What is it that you're worried about? So he's on maximum therapy orally, but still not right. Yeah. So well done, Captain. Yes, Amina, absolutely. So I told you the sign, one of the signs of DKA is that they're getting, you know, the high sugar re, um, symptoms, which is drinking too much, eating too much, losing weight, and they get tummy aches. Absolutely. If you've got a patient like that, hopefully he's, nothing is going on. But when I, the triple therapy I put down, because a lot of patients on triple therapy, they've got no pancreatic function left to produce insulin. So these patients then can go into um, DKA because, well, because they require insulin essentially soon as. Yeah, but the other causes are if they get an infection, they can go into DK as, as, as well. And of course, if they're not using the insulin as they should be in go DK, but that's absolutely the right thing in terms of the um, um, sort of emergency and mental sign force. The next slide, please, Paul. Right, this is a 56 year old. And again, just put your answer in the chat function. He asked you, what is including in the annual review? What should you say? What are you going to do in an annual review? Just put the answers there. So he's been told he needs to come for an annual review and he's asking you, what, what, what are you going to do? What, what is it going to happen? So just put in what we've discussed before in an annual review. And if, uh, yeah, the slide that I showed you annual review is the one you actually need because it covers literally everything. So I've got BP, weight, BMI, foot check, yeah, blood test, foot check, BP, BMI, yeah, foot check, eyes, medication concerns, side effects, blood pressure, pulse, well done, Nikki. Blood, ACR, yeah, Amina, well done, ACR, remember the ACR. Compliance with medication, do you remember what I told you about the complications? What are you going to ask? Immunization, fantastic, what else? I want a bit more. You remember I told you to sign post them, what are you going to sign post them to? Yes, Diabetes UK for 8K processes. Yeah, brilliant. But a bit more than 8K processes, Marco, because you're doing an annual review, you definitely need to do 8K processes. But <clears throat> in addition, do you remember what I said? <clears throat> DVLA. Yeah? Erectile dysfunction. Have they got that? Have they got any new bowel or bladder symptoms? Are they feeling dizzy when they stand? Have they got, <clears throat> excuse me, pain in the legs? Because you are really looking to see if they have having the complications from diabetes, in which case you need to filter them through to the other sort of risk um, category, if they're having any of those. So don't forget the annual review doesn't just include the 8K process, you've got to ask about others. And, but well done, you've got most of the things that would be covered here anyway. Okay, well done. Next slide, please, Paul. We're almost finished. So this is a, a 81 year old, tells you she's feeling unwell on a current medication, metformin and glycolides. Early morning for the past few weeks, she wakes up sweating. What's happening here? Do you remember I told you about being aware of some of the drugs? Yeah, well done, Captain. Yes, well done, Marco, really good. So the symptoms of hypos are you feel like, you know, there's, you've got sort of butterflies in the stomach initially, you've got this feeling that you've got to collapse, you get sweaty, shaky, and that means, and she's on this drug. Which drug is it that she's on that's causing uh, low blood sugars, do you think? She's on metformin and glycoside. Yeah, absolutely, Catherine. So glycoside, you remember I mentioned to you, glycoside side effect is low blood sugars. So actually, it may well be that she's having hypo at night and that um, you will need to get her to check that she was there, in which case, those adjustments of glycoside or even stopping glycoside um, may be indicated at 81. You know, we, we, are, we might be happy with slightly higher uh, blood sugar readings if she's got other comorbidities. Okay, so that's where the target kind of comes in. But, you know, well done for those people that got that she's actually possibly having hypos. Do remember glycoside, hypos, and that's one of the common drugs that is used um, for managing diabetes. Okay, next slide, please. Paul, thank you. 
So this is case nine. I think we almost were at the end. This is a 42-year-old with moderate LD. And again, I use this example um, in every presentation because I just want you to be aware that um, there are there might be some unique um, sort of requirements for patients with LD. This patient's obese, the blood pressure isn't at target, and neither is the cholesterol. Okay, so what would one do? I talked to you about the personalized care uh, targets, so you may need to push them into the other categories. But also, if the targets were all good, you might need to involve a multidisciplinary, the local community learning disability team, the uh, matrons, and other people. There may be, we need to look at the care package, um, and we might need to involve the social worker as well. So what I'm trying to say here essentially is, um, yes, he's, he's a known diabetic, and I should have put down, thank you for that, Amina. So um, um, this is a known diabetic with really poor parameters. And the point really of this slide was, if you've got somebody um, uh, with LD, just make sure you have a multi-professional sort of approach for them um, to manage, because it's not just good enough saying them go and exercise. You may need to decide who's going to take them for exercise, what exercise can they do, et cetera. You know, what is a care package currently look like? So have a discussion um, in a multi-professional manner with the social worker as to what are those needs and how would the team essentially meet that need? Um, and there's care as assessment, et cetera. So just be mindful not to make the decision on their own. Hopefully this patient will not be sitting in your uh, low risk group, but I just wanted you to be aware that even if their parameters are controlled, you might still need um, uh, a multi-professional approach because unless the support is there, diabetes is a progressive uh, sort of condition for some of the people, and they may just progress and simply put um, some uh, sort of tight parameters in support now. The next and last um, slide, I think it is. Um, so the self-assessment for people that um, managed to get the self-assessment before, I'm just going to ask you to put true and false here. So only patients over 40 should be screened for diabetes, true or false? You can self-assess and see. So this, this is false. Do you remember when I said screening is for risk factors? And it's from the age of 25 for certain ethnic groups. And if you've got the risk factors and you've got symptoms. So this is false. Patients should be reviewed every six months for the age care purposes. So, I mean, this, this could be uh, true for patients that have got the care processes out of range, but it could be false. Patients who've had their age courses, everything is in place. They need an annual review, not every six months. So this could go either way, okay? Diagnosis of diabetes should be made using HbA1c only. I hope you were forward to that because remember we discussed HbA1c, fasting glucose, or postprandial after blood, you know, after um, sort of random sorry, sugars could all be used to make diagnoses. And if they are symptomatic, one reading, asymptomatic, uh, you could you need a second reading two weeks apart and try and stick to the same um, diagnostic parameters. So if you've done HbA1c first time, do HbA1c second time as well. Diagnostic level is um, is over um, is 48. That is true, and that's what we discussed. That's over 7, over 11.1, and over 48 is uh, diagnostic level for diabetes. Uh, the next is all patients should have sugars between 4 and 7. Well, no, not really, because the target depends on the patient who's sitting in front of you, and that could vary, ideally between 5 and 7. Um, but that target could vary, depends on, you know, on the patient's personal circumstances and other comorbidities as well. It could be higher, can't be lower, it could be higher. So the next one is hypoglycemic level is less than four. Again, self-check, this is true. This is how we define it's 3.9 and under. So less than four really is hypoglycemia. And that's how you define hypoglycemia. So you see lots of trees in the blood sugar reading, then, um, then yes. So the HbA1c should be two weeks apart, okay? And when you do request the HbA1c, if you are using CyberLab, there is two boxes you can tick. If you tick in the box for just HbA1c, the lab will reject it. If you tick in the box for HbA1c for diagnosis, I've had a discussion with lab, they will process it because they will not repeat HbA1c um, um, before if they're known diabetic. It's only for diagnostic. So make sure any form that you're using, you clarify is for diagnostic purposes and the lab will do it. 
Foot check includes pulse and sensations only. Well, not really, as I mentioned. Examination is a key. Symptom is a key. And you check for, uh, you know, you check for um, uh, um, the um, bunions, you check for callosities, you check the nails. Examination is a key part of foot check. You know, you check for the arches, you check for dry skin. So that's all. And you check for ulcers, as I mentioned to you, the patient that I had with ulcers. So you need to check the foot, uh, examine pulse and sensation. All diabetic patients, high cholesterol should start in statin. Well, uh, no, because what NICE is saying, if they're curious, um, then you should start on statin. So it's not all diabetic patients, but actually um, I've noted that anybody from the age of 35 that has uh, got a slight BMI slightly higher over 25, they end up with a high, you know, high Q risk anyway. So actually most of the patients are on um, high um, on statin, okay? So the blood pressure target is less than 114.90. So we discussed that if it's somebody under the age of 80, over the age of um, 80, there's different targets. So um, for under 80, absolutely less than 114.90, over is 150.90. But if they've got blood pressure and CKD, it's 138. Lots of figures to remember, but just, just find a way of sticking things on the wall and remembering to do that, and that will become second nature. I don't expect you to remember that, um, um, or you know, just after one, uh, one attending one session today. Insulin lump should be checked at every review. If the patient's on insulin, absolutely, and I, I, I know this is true, you should check for lumps because lumps will not allow insulin to work. Insulin will just sit there and you know, trickle in or not even trickle in, so they can cause. Um, you know, hypos later on or a very high reading. So please do check for lumps. And as I mentioned to you, lumps are better seen than felt. Check them from the side, make the patient stand on the side and check um, if they've got any um, sort of lumps there and ask them to change position. Check them when you do your annual reviews, where they're injecting, are they rotating the site? And as the photo I showed you, which is metrical lump, as in the patient's head, he is rotating the site. He's doing morning and evening, but actually rotation means you do morning, evening, tummy, next day, morning, evening, and then the thighs next day, you know, or, or rotate around the umbilicus, you just rotate. You can mark and rotate. It's not the same site every day, uh, morning, evening, okay? It's just rotation, otherwise you will end up with lumps, and they take months to go. Okay, um, right, so question time now. I hope you've been able to mark yourselves and, and see where, you know, the gaps were. And hopefully you've got the answers to those. I'm going to just now move on to the last bit, which is about questions. Um, so anyone got any last minute questions or anything that they feel hasn't been covered? Um, uh, we, we think it's co covered the learning outcomes, but if there's anything else you want to ask, for those that have attended here and will be doing a medium and high risk, it's good you know what happens at the low risk. We'll be going into a lot more detail with the um, high risk uh, and medium risk in terms of medication control. Um, so, um, if the patient, so Mark has got a question: if the patient uh, age one c over forty eight, and the second has age very close to forty seven, would you request a third? Uh, no, no, Mark. So the guidance is very clear: you have to have two positives. So that patient will still be in the pre diabetic um, sort of range. So you put them as pre diabetes and repeat hb one c If you are concerned that actually they are rapidly progressing to become diabetic, so the weight is gone up and you know, you, they're getting all other sort of symptoms, you can repeat that um, hb one c in three to six months, but you will not make a diagnosis based on that second reason, no. Yeah? So the other question, Nina, is uh, if the blood pressure is above 90, that's the it still comes as considering lowering blood pressure and cough pop up. Yes, as I mentioned to you, the cost target is slightly different um, to the, um, the nice um, um, amina. So, but the pop up will come as long as the blood pressure target should be less than um, it should be less than ninety. But cough is not separating that. So there is that sort of discrepancy, like cholesterol, with the blood pressure as well. So I'd like you to speak to your PC and CDs and see what is that. You know, ideally, because it's cross that we would be looking at, ideally, you should be really making sure that the level is below the cross target, but also below the nice target. So I would say both, Amina. Okay, any other questions?
And do remember, Mina, it said if you put 90 as a reading, it was still wanted you to be lower because it wants you to be less than 90. Yeah? So if you put 89, it'll take that sort of alert away unless they've got CKD in that, in which they will say 130, 80. So do, do remember, and you can do the blood pressure again um, again and again until you hit the less than 90. And if it is less than 90, you may need, well need to review the medication. Any other questions? Mahi, Nikki, Catherine, anything else? Marco, Oris? Anyone else? Anything else? Okay, I think that's fine, Paul. I think we've um, um, so thank you all guys for listening. I, I, I hope it's been useful. I just want you to do the poll now. I just want to see the confidence level uh, before I we just say the final buys. Paul, would you mind just putting the poll up for me, please? And if you just submit the poll again, I don't know if it's the same problem as last time. We've got two questions, Paul. So maybe the, um, Paul, how do you want to do this? Paul? So we're getting, we've got a few responses. Uh, we've got three out of six, there's six people now. We've got four out of six now. They're all coming in at the upper end. Uh, I've got one six. Uh, one, just waiting for one last person to. I still can't submit mine, so I'll pop it in the comments. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, so the results across the two questions, and I'm just apologise. I don't know why it's um, why it's not working. I'll, I'll look into that for the next the next session. Uh, but. So we've, that, yeah. Go on, Paul. Everything's in the uppers. Yeah, which is brilliant. So yeah, so for those that have marked still six, I, uh, there there will be sort of further sessions. If you feel there's any any gaps, uh, you are more than happy for you to email us uh, with any questions or anything that you ha have further that we can address. Because it's really sometimes it's a case of you just doing it and getting the confidence. But as long as you've had some basic information about how best to manage a patient when you see, and I particularly want to use this focus on that annual review sort of um, template. Okay, so great guys. Thank you ever so much for participating in the discussion and being here. I do hope you've learned something. Paul, are you going to be sending a feedback or is this a poll of feedback? Paul? Um, so we are going to try and send out feedback uh, oh, can you hear me? You should yeah, be able to hear me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, let me just come back into the room. Um, so yes, we will send out a um, a feedback form. Uh, what we'll also do is send out links for our uh, making every contact count training and motivational interviewing that Tracy mentioned earlier. Those two, the MEC and the MI, are really good for particularly for the the lower risk. Um, uh, case management uh, but the most facial interview and also up into the kind of mediums to highs and we'll also share um to your sort of pcn leads and the clinical leads uh information about the video group consultations which again lend themselves really good to these kind of um, lifestyle type uh, managements uh, so and i've posted in the chat but i'll send it out again um the link the eventbrite link to register for the diabetes diet session coming on the 26th i think or whenever it was 24th let's have a look Ooh, lots of um, discussion in this one now uh it is on the 26th of august at four o'clock okay guys thank you ever so much and um i'll see you perhaps at the medium some of you at least the medium and high risk um Next week, is it next week? I can't remember when it is, whenever. Uh -huh. It's on the 24th, I think. Okay, all right. Lovely, have a, have a great afternoon and um, happy working. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.